Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to my presentation. My name is Mateusz Petrowski, and today I'll tell you about, about um, performance analysis of D-Trace on FreeBSD and eBPF on Linux. And the main question we would like to um, answer today is what overhead does tracing impose on a system? So we'll try to get some intuitions what's happening when you trace. Uh, the outline is uh, the following. First, I'm going to tell you a couple of words about me. And we'll briefly talk about observability and tracers. And then we'll jump straight into benchmarks that I prepared. And then some conclusion future work. So a uh, few words about me. I'm a FreeBSD user since 2016. Two years later, I got uh, commit bit for ports, then for documentation. And then in 2022, I was elected to serve on the uh, core team. And I'm working with folks at Clara on things like FreeBSD, performance engineering, and OpenZFS. <clears throat> so let's talk about observability. Um, in general, we like to know what's happening on our systems, right? And usually we have a good idea of more or less what's happening there, but then we operate our systems and then we have an unusually, unusually high memory consumption. Or maybe we spot that our CPUs are uh, busy computing something we didn't mean to have running on our production system. Or maybe there is some weird kind of IO that's happening and it's uh, destroying the performance of our systems. And, all of those cases, um, in all in all of those cases, we want to understand what's happening in our systems, and that's where observability comes into play. Um, for example, we can use uh, tracers in the development and debugging of um, processes. For example, in this case, we we see DWatch. It's a very nice wrapper around DTrace. It's available on FreeBSD. Um, the nice thing is that instead of scripting your the trace script from scratch, you can use uh, pre-existing profiles. In this, in, in this case, we use a profile called proc and we filter by sleep. And then here we can see that someone started a process called sleep uh, for 50 seconds and then it was terminated a second later. Uh, we can also use tracers to obtain metrics about our system. And since with tracers, we can uh, observe any part of our systems. We can, be, we can be very precise about the metrics we obtain from the system, right? Sometimes we want to um, know things that are not exposed by existing tools, or we want to be uh, we want to, we want to obtain those metrics at a very specific time or something. So with tracers, we are able to do it. We can build nice dashboards later on. That's nice. But then it sounds almost too good to be true, right? It's a lot of functionalities. And it's potentially slow, but it's not too bad. But what we need to be aware of is the uh, prop effect, which is an unintended alteration in system behavior caused by measuring that system. So basically, when you start looking in your system and you gather metrics, you inadvertently uh, modify how the system behaves. And this is unavoidable, right? Because you have to do it that's how things work but you'd like to minimize minimize the impact you you impose on the system when you do it <clears throat> and tracers are pretty good about it so let's talk about tracers um we'll talk about dtrace and bpf trace and i'll give you like a quick crash course how they look like and how they behave so this is a typical um let's say interaction you may have with dtrace so it's a command line so you have a dtrace um, command there. Um, with minus n, you can specify the uh, script that you want to run. So over here, we have a first. We, have, we see a probe in, in orange. Uh, this is um, this is where you want to attach your dtrace in your system. And then whenever um, this is call is uh, well called or actually returns, um, dtrace is going to do something about it. Um, then we have a predicate. This is the way of, of filtering when your probe is actually executing the, the action body. So even though we um, dtrace is going to, to watch um, the, the end of the read system call, it's only going to execute the action body when it's SSHD 
calling read. So that's nice. And in this case, we have a little action body with an aggregation inside, which builds a histogram that we can see in the bottom of the slide. Um, yeah, so what happens is that you hit enter here, then you see a, a message from Dtrace that's okay, I matched two probes, it's tracing now. And when you interrupt, you're gonna see the collected results so far. Um, this is nice. And BPF trace looks very similar. So they have slightly different uh, names. So they don't call the action body uh, an action body, it's called an action. And then inside you have things, for example, map functions of aggregations. Um, but ultimately, you also get a histogram and you can uh, reason about your system this way. Um, when it comes to the syntax of those two languages, they are very similar. Most of the differences come from the uh, differences in the underlake operating systems. As you can see over here, we have a trace point system, syscall something something, but on with dtrace we had a set of different syntax because it's a different kind of um, way of attaching to your operating system. Um, and then you have different kinds of probes, and we can divide them into user space kernel and static and dynamic probes. So in general, static probes are those that you create during compilation, and they usually offer stable interface. So you, so when you create a script to trace, you can be sure that throughout the, um, in the development of the system, you're, it, it, it won't be broken, right? Um, at least when it's not necessary. Um, it may slightly impact the performance, even when it's not attached to. Um, but that's the cost of a static probe. And then we have the dynamic probes. They are created ad hoc. They offer unstable interface because it's usually just the signature of a function inside the kernel uh, or the user space. Um, so if someone changes the signature, your script is going to break. Um, the benefit is that you can attach to pretty much any part of the system, any function. So um, that's nice. And also there is no performance penalty for having this for the possibility of attaching. Um, right, and then on regarding specific facilities we have in operating system for that, for user space dynamic probes, we have the bit provider on FreeBSD and the roughly equivalent is uProbe on Linux. Although uProbe is, um, well, they're quite different actually. And we're gonna see it later on. Uh, I have a very nice example of how you have to sometimes work around uh, some uh, missing features in the bit provider. Then the user space static probes, they use the same technology, USDT. Uh, it's actually, uh, as far as I know, it comes from the Dtrace world and it was um, included in many programs like, you know, like Java and Python and then other tracers now reuse this, um, uh, this interface that was created for Dtrace. And then for kernel dynamic probes, on FreeBSD, we have FBT, like Function Boundary Tracing Provider. And we have K, K probes on Linux. Um, and then for static probes, we have SDT and FreeBSD and trace points in Linux. Uh, you'll see those names on the slides where I introduced some scripts I use for benchmarking. That's why I wanted you to have some overview of what's available there and what's the distinction. So benchmarks, let's talk about benchmarks. Uh, I have two benchmarks today for you. The first one is a, a micro benchmark where we read from dev0 and write to dev now. And the goal here is to see what's the overhead of basic features of a tracer. And it's based on the benchmark from Brendan Gregg's uh, BPF Performance Tools book. It's a very nice book. And, um, but the nicest part about it is that it's a published result that I can refer to and then we can compare if what I created actually makes sense. And then from benchmark number two, the workload is building the FreeBSD kernel. Uh, this is the second um, published result about uh, tracers overhead I could find. Um, over here, we, as making the kernel is quite a complex workload. So we are um, um, tracing a lot of different parts of the operating system. Um, so that's a kind of a macro benchmark, and it's based on the CADES technical report when the, where the benchmark was published. 
Um, for the benchmarking harness, I used Hyperfine. It's a little tool written in Rust. Um, and it comes with uh, a couple of Python scripts that you can use to uh, do some statistical analysis of your results. It outputs JSON, it takes care of the warm-up runs, it allows you to specify, um, set up a cleanup script, it detects outliers, so you can quickly iterate on your benchmark and um, generate some sound results pretty quickly. Uh, it's, I really recommend it. It helps you to avoid re reinventing the wheel and um, it's very nice to work with. Regarding the benchmark runs, um, this is how a benchmark was structured. So in every benchmark, I have a couple of tracing scripts, right? So what I do, I start a tracing script once, and then I re-execute the workload a couple of times. And every time Hyperfine is measuring how long it took for the workload to finish. So it has a couple of benefits. Uh, for example, um, some of the early runs are a bit faster because, um, well, maybe D-Trace and BPF trace are not that overloaded yet, but then it gets quite stable after like five runs, let's say. So having it this way, I could have those warm-up runs and then have a consistent stream of results. Um, yeah, so that's how it looks like. For the system setup, I had two servers, AMD64. They both had 32 CPUs and almost 400 gigabytes of RAM. Um, one of them was running FreeBSD 13.1, and the other one was running Ubuntu 2004 with a, with a BPS, BPF trace, uh, not from the package repo because it was quite old, but I used one that is now like three months old or something. So I had newer features, and it was also a bit more stable. Um, and of course, I disabled some obvious things like uh, hyper-threading, dynamic frequency scaling. I, make, I made sure that uh, there are no, um, let's say, administrative demons running on the system when I'm benchmarking. Um, I try to make sure that the system is actually idling when I'm not benchmarking, or when I'm benchmarking. Um, Right. So let's take a look at the first benchmarks. So that's the workload I had. It's 10,000, sorry, 10 million bytes. And we copy one byte at a time from dev zero to dev now. Um, it's 10 million because it's um, a reasonable amount for modern CPUs. It takes a couple of seconds to finish. So it's just the perfect value for, for, a, for a quick micro benchmark. Um, yeah, so the, the, the goal was to the, the measurement of per event cost of different tracer features. Um, I also um, followed the, the recommendation of uh, Brendan Gregg from the book to, to, to use the principle of least perturbation, which is to pick the fastest run for the final comparison of results. This is, uh, to those of you who know how to benchmark, this is a red flag probably, right? because you don't really pick the fastest run usually um, because you tend to ignore things like the, the, um, the tail, right, of, your, of the distribution of your timing and so on. But in this case, it actually makes sense because you want to see what's the overhead if everything goes perfectly, right? So in the best scenario, what's happening to the overhead of my system? Um, we have 18 different tracing scripts um, and the setup and results are described in, in, in this book. Um, the workload is running on exactly one CPU uh, together with, this, with the tracer. And Brendan's results are, were done on Linux 4.15 on a single core and also um, probably on a way older version of BPF trace. So the results you're going to see um, with the results I've, I gathered for BPF trace are probably way faster than what he could achieve at that point. So, scripts. So the first one is quite boring. This is a control script. This is a script I use to trace nothing, to simulate that there is nothing happening. This uh, simplified my, my benchmarking setup. Um, this is K probes and K red probes, so the dynamic kernel tracing. So on the left side, we, we have the VFS read. 
on FreeBSD, we don't have VFS read that I can attach to with FBT because it's not a function. It's a macro, so it's not something DTrace can attach to. So I decided to pick um, some other function that was um, on the call stack. So it was do file reads seemed like a reasonable choice. Um, when, you do, when you're doing real, real world tracing, you would use VFS provider on FreeBSD instead of FBT for tracing VFS. But in this case, we want to uh, benchmark dynamic kernel tracing. So we use FBT. Um, for trace points, entry and return, this map split pretty cleanly. On Linux, you have the trace point system calls sys enter read. On FreeBSD, you have the handy Cisco provider. Um, so that's nice. Um, and then the U probe tracing. So on Linux, it's very clean. If you want to trace the uh, read function in Ellipse, you just do it like this. But on FreeBSD, it's not so easy because of what we see over here is file-based tracing. So when you start this thing in BPF trace, it will trace every process that calls read in Ellipse now, but also every process that is going to start in the future. So it's not depending on the process, it's depending on the file. It's not, there is no equivalent in FreeBSD. So I had to hack around to make my um, well benchmarking setup recreate this functionality. Um, so let's see how it looks like. So I have it split into three uh, slides. This is the beginning of the of my Ditray script. So first of all, I have to activate the destructive uh, pragma. Uh, this is because I'm gonna spawn a child process in this um, Ditray script. And I have some free constants, right? And the first one gives me like the exact process name and arguments that I have to match later on um, with my probes and the libc prefix so that I can detect that my um, workload is actually reading libc at this point. Um, this is the parent script. Okay, so there's a lot happening over here. And the reason why it's like this, the, the reason why we have to do some dance with the libc is because I cannot just uh, wait for the process, for, for my new workload to uh, be created and then attach to it straight away. Because at this point, the read function is not yet in its address space. Like it's, it, it hasn't loaded libc yet, right? So there is nothing to attach to for dtrace. So it will complain that, hey, I, I, I don't know what you mean by libc read. So what we have to do instead, we have to wait for our uh, workload to um, open the libc, and then on the return from the open from the from on the return of the open system call, we capture its file descriptor, and this way um, over here when we finally close the libc, we detect that okay, this is the file descriptor we that's like um, related to libc and. At this point, I assume that, okay, so uh, the process now, now knows what libc is and what those read functions are. So I'm gonna stop it and then spawn a, a child trace script that's gonna use the pit provider to trace this exact, um, well, workload invocation. And then there's some cleanup. So for the child process, it looks like this. So there is the pit provider that some of you probably know very well. Um, the nice thing is, is at this point it actually works, right? Because we have a pit that we can attach to, the read function is there. So nice, we can attach to it. And then when the pro process exits, we also terminate the detrace script. So that's a lot of hacking around to just achieve this, this um, functionality, but it works. And you'll be surprised with the results later on, I guess. Um, um, and we have some more scripts. So uh, and also uh, benchmarks filter and map. Um, it maps very cleanly. The only um, tricky thing was that sometimes the arguments are different, but that's how our operating systems are designed. Sometimes they have different structures, right? And you have to look for your data in different places. Um, then we have the single key string key, and two keys for the aggregations. It turns out that um, Using strings for keys in 
um, using string, strings as keys is, is not very performant because of the way how strings are represented inside the trace. Um, apparently, it made sense for, for Brendan to also benchmark it, it on BPF trace. So I guess that over there, there's also like some, some difference how it's handled. Can you actually hear me? Because like I, I hear that when I'm talking like this, it's much louder. <laughs> um, okay, then um, the overhead of user stack and kernel stack, it also maps very cleanly. Um, the use of histograms, the names are different. So in BPF trace, we have hist and D trace, we have quantized, but ultimately it's the same idea. Um, then the timing. So um, trying to figure out how was the overhead in case we do the very popular uh, tracing of how long it takes for a function to, to, uh, to execute, right? We, we start at the do file read entry, then we take a copy of the timestamp and then we um, take a look how long it took later on in the return. And then some mix of many different features like case stack, use stack, two keys and the histogram. And finally, a per event um, script, which is just printing something whenever we fire a probe. So the results. Um, this is not very readable, so let's we'll, we'll just skip to this and to this. Um, so the most important part is that um, you can see that K probes and K return K read probes are. Um, so K return probes are slower than K probes. This is expected, so that's nice. That's how it's implemented in Linux. Uh, on FreeBSD, it doesn't make much of a difference. So that's also great because that's what we expected. The trace point um, tracing, this is pretty similar on all the systems. That's nice. And the U probes, um, this is actually where DTrace is performing very well. So that's nice to see that even with my hacking uh, around, it's, it's still performing very well. Um, then we have some other results, uh, but ultimately when tracing frequent events like system calls, the overhead can be as high as 600%. Implementation of probes has a huge impact on performance. Uh, for example, return probes are not as expensive as, as expensive on FreeBSD as they are on Linux. And DPF trace seems to have a better performance overall than DTrace, but the per event cost um, is surprisingly low on FreeBSD, like as you can see over here, and we'll talk about it a bit later. Let's talk about benchmark number two. I think I have to speed up a bit. Um, so over here, we built the FreeBSD kernel. It was DTrace only, so I had to port it to BPF trace. I'm building the kernel on an in-memory disk, like um, MD uh, on FreeBSD. And it's UFS on FreeBSD and XFS on Linux. I didn't use X4, XT4 because it was my root partition and I didn't want to trace everything that's happening on my system apart from my benchmark. Um, and it seemed reasonable enough. And I also had to bump the BPF trace limits a bit because I'm going to trace thousands of probes at this point. So the scripts, those are the scenarios from the CALP report. Uh, they're a bit cryptic, but basically uh, for every provider, they uh, have a different scenario what they trace. UFS, for example, is tracing all UFS calls, <laughs> and then UFS OCC is open, close, create. Um, specifically, it looks like this. So on the right side, you can see what, what was in the CADIS report. On the left side, you see my port of it. It's short pretty cleanly. The only, uh, there were some hiccups like the, there is no XFS close. So I had to use F put in that. But that's in for this kind of benchmark, micro benchmark, it doesn't really make that much sense. That's much of a difference, I hope. Uh, then that's um, Cisco provider, it also maps pretty cleanly. For VFS, there is no Bob close, so I found a rough equivalent of underscore underscore close FD. And the scheduler is either we traced or not. And the results, pop, pop, pop. Okay, so. What is interesting here, maybe I should disable this a bit cleaner. So as you can see, cadets and dtrace, so those are like both dtrace runs. Um, my, my results, they seem to correspond to what we see in the cadets report. Uh, whenever there is a spike in, in the overhead, we also can see the spike in my dtrace results. 
The nice thing is that when you look at the BPF trace table, you can also see those spikes, but they're much lower. It looks like in case of large macro benchmarks, BPF trace is performing quite well. Um, so when tracing complex workloads, the overhead of tracing is measurable, over 1% definitely, and significant, over 5%, but not necessarily too expensive. So that's a that's good news. Um, BPF trace seems to all outperform D-trace, but I observed that sometimes BPF trace takes a lot to actually like quit. And that was surprising. So I did some experiments and I found a smoking gun. Um, so you probably know the ktrace.d uh, script. It's a script that allows you to select a system call. And then um, when someone calls the system call, you get a whole uh, like a call path, let's say, of what's happening to, to, until the moment the system call returns. And it's very nice for exploring what's happening in the kernel. Um, you can attach to five to, to 50, over 50,000 probes and it returns the results in under one in around one second. So it's a very nice tool. It's um, easy to use. It's nice. So I tried to port it to BPF. And first I had to bump the, the limits of BPF trace a lot. I also had to extend the script to actually limit the amount of probes I can attach to. Over here you can see that I'm only attaching to ext4 underscore functions because uh, if I were to attach to all the functions in the Linux kernel, it just wouldn't work. And even with 1000 probes, it still took 45 seconds to return. So I could I, I saw there is the the the, the call stack very quickly, uh, as expected. But it took a lot of time for BPF trace to clean up everything and return and say that okay I'm done. So that's interesting. I haven't investigated what's happening there, but that's definitely not expected. So conclusion: future work overhead is significant, but not necessarily expensive. Um, this is the nomenclature from uh, Brendan, Brendan Gregg's books. Um, and that's what we um, observed in those results. A lot depends on the frequency of the traced events. As you saw in the in case of the first benchmark, when you are tracing system calls and you do a lot of, of them, you can the overhead is going to explode. But then when you have a macro benchmark and you do many things at once, and it's um, then even if you trace thousands of probes and it's not very smart, you this overhead is still not that. Um, I mean, it's you can contain it, right? Perhaps it's in your production environment, thirty percent is way too high, but um, at least now you can have an idea what you're dealing with when you're tracing. Um, D-trace performance is more predictable, um, so it's definitely not faster, but it seems like a more stable piece of technology so far. Um, if you're looking for tracers that have under 1% overhead, you should look at Qtrace. It's a very nice tool. I worked with it a bit um, during my research, um, and I do, do recommend it. And regarding the uh, future work, um, well, we should uh, boldly go where no one has gone before. And um, there are many interesting things to explore in the performance overhead um, area. So, yeah. And before I finish, a special thanks to uh, the following folks for helping me with my research. They're very helpful and um, it would be very difficult to finish it without them. And that's it. Thank you. You traced your recommending mm -hmm. that is the one owned by the GitHub user sites, yes, exactly. Okay, there is a very nice book that comes, uh, that was written about it. It's called, um, mm, trace uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> understanding performance analysis, understanding software dynamics, yes, oh, okay. and it's a, it's a very good book. Username. Is your name maybe like, like, is this yeah. really the one he's talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah. Um Pablo. You mentioned uh, the probes. Uh mm -hmm. whether it's overhead, even if not used, uh, 
That's what the manual page says. I haven't measured it, uh, but that's what the manual page on FreeBSD says. So I assume it's still true. There is something not optimal about the way we implement them or we implemented them in the past, but forgot to update the manual page. Wondering what kind of overhead that is. Mm, I don't remember. There was something about the latency. So maybe there's just some, some dummy instructions that you have to skip over and it's not that obvious for the CPU to do it. And just be good to know it's like under 1% or... Oh. Yeah, that would be good to know. <laughs> okay, then um, thank you very much and um, have a nice conference.